Look at everyone. Tom, we're live. Phil Tarrant here from REB. Tom Panos, Real Estate Gym. Hope you're well. Hope you're smiling. Locked up right across Australia, here particularly in New South Wales. Going to get into some pretty hot topics today for Real Estate Exposed. This is when me and Tom get together once a week to have a good old-fashioned rant sometimes of what's going wrong with the world, but then most importantly, what real estate agents can do to conquer this market. Tom, you're well, you're good, you're smiling, you're happy. Listen, I'm well. I have to tell you, each week seems to be rolling into each week at the moment, right? Each day is beginning to roll onto each day, Phil, right? Um, and hi to everyone that's coming on. Rodeo Grady, Alex Skipper, Paul Anthony Hay. We're on Facebook, by the way, and we're on LinkedIn and we're on YouTube and we're on Periscope. Um, so, Phil, we're going all over the place. But, Phil, this is... This is week six. This is week six of the lockdown. And um, uh, I don't know. I want to ask you, and I'd like to ask the audience that's coming on, if you are in Sydney, when do you think the lockdown will end? What do you reckon, Phil? Well, we're told um, that they will revisit the current restrictions at the end of this month. And what is it, the 5th of August now? So there's still quite a long way to run. Uh, in August. So um, my view, and I think we spoke about it, Tom, I reckon uh, when school holidays happen and term four happens for school kids, I reckon that's going to be the the circuit breaker to getting kids back uh, to school and relaxing some of the restrictions we have right now. That's my view. That's my read. Uh, they're hitting it hard on this vaccine message. You only need to look at the stats about what's going on now uh, in relation to vaccine rollout. They want people to get jabs in their arm. It's the rhetoric you're hearing day in, day out, day in, day out. Um, that's my view. That's what I think. Uh, I think we're going to have restrictions all the way up until the end of this year, this calendar year. Um, maybe in uh, Christmas, in December and New Year's Eve, we'll be able to get together and have a few drinks as friends and families. Who knows? But I watch a lot of right-wing media. I watch a lot of left-wing media, mate. And uh, it depends where you sit on the political spectrum is probably what your view to this is. What's your view, mate? Well, I'm reading what people are saying. My late brother's uh, best mate's on here, Rodeo Grady, very smart operator who's a, a senior senior public servant. He's saying uh, end of October. Maria is saying mid-September. Michael Rostevsky is saying November. Um, Jack Abraham is saying at least another two months. Um, Phil, um, i actually beginning to think more a bit like what people are saying. I think it's going to be longer rather than sooner and i think at the moment what's happening is the people that are advising the new south wales premier are probably saying to her listen let's just go with the flow let's not say too much now because i think phil i think that there are certain groups of people as reported in the press yesterday lifeline having its largest number of call-ins since they actually began operating that organization. So they've had the largest number of phone calls in a day, right? And what do people call? Because they're stressed, they're anxious, they're depressed, they're grieving, all those reasons. They're all sad reasons. So I'm thinking, Phil, that they're reluctant to actually say anything because I think some people are doing it hard Mentally, some people are doing it hard mentally and financially. If they actually said something along the lines is, which is, hey, I'm letting you know the 28th probably won't be the date, that for many people, that would be like just a hammer, a sledgehammer hitting them at the moment. I think that's the biggest challenge right now. And, and I've been pretty positive on how Australia has navigated COVID-19. When you think back to when we were chatting this time last year, Tom, you know, the the JobKeeper program, putting stimulus in there, keeping Australians at least putting some money in their back pocket so they can maintain um, uh, some level of of, of um, expense management and put food on the table. But, mate, this time around, on the first episode of uh, Real Estate Exposed, we spoke about what we thought and how we thought the, the New South Wales government was tracking and we were reasonably complimentary. But, you know, I'm starting to wane a little bit on it now as well. You know, we've got a Premier there who's got a tough job, let's call it out. It's a difficult job. But who is actually running the state at the moment? Is it these chief health scientists who are making the decisions based on what they think worst case scenario is? And you look into it, mate, and, you know, 
they're, they're making these decisions in a very comfortable environment. I acknowledge that it's tough and they've got the responsibility of the state on their shoulders. They're not concerned about putting food on the table. They're still getting their big salaries. So they're going to err on the side of conservative. But who's actually got the balls and the backbone to actually drive it forward? And if it's not going to be the end of August, that's fine. Just tell us that way. You know, don't see, keep hanging it out, hanging it out, hanging it out. Please. It's very interesting, Phil, you say that because it appears to be, it appears to be this default script. It's it's like scripts and dialogues for politicians, right? Yeah. Like scripts and dialogues for real estate, it appears the standard script or dialogue is, hey, this is what our medical experts are saying, right? It's like, I can't tell you exactly, but I can tell you that they're an expert, right? This is what our medical experts are saying. Who's the expert? I presume they're referring to, well, whoever it is, Karen Chant, or in Queensland, uh, that uh, Jenny Young, I think it is. Um, and I'm not quite too sure who the person is in, in Melbourne, but we're probably talking more about New South Wales. But, you know, Phil, like, you know, the reason we've got that bottom banner on there now is that I just finished an interview with... Um, uh, Tim McGibbon from the Real Estate Institute, right? And he was just putting information out there for what you can and can't do. He gives a regular update on what the REI's position is on things, right? And he said, you can you can go if you live in the Canterbury-Bankstown area, which is in one of the LGA areas, you can go to look at a property in Byron Bay. It's not against the law. You can actually leave. So so you can't leave Canterbury Banks down to go to, say, uh, uh, North Sydney, right? Uh, but you can leave Canterbury Banks down to go to Byron Bay to look at a unit for sale, right, and see whether you want to buy it or not and then come back here, right? And then you hear of other stories. I've got a client of mine now who's devastated because... He's, uh, his wife's, uh, his wife's um, grandfather has just died and he was more or less the person that brought her up. And he said, mate, you know, we're trying to work out who's actually going to the funeral because there's only 10 people allowed there. Then you hear of stories about people, Phil, that, you know, knew, you, it wasn't too long ago that you had a newborn coming to your family. So if you could just picture the scenario, being at the hospital, you not allowed being there and that, you know, um, your, your partner, your wife had to actually uh, give birth on her own on what... what was, uh, was like a pretty, pretty important time. Is that my microphone or yours? I think it's your mic, mate. Okay, what about that? Is that better? Yeah, looking good, sounding good. Okay. So, Phil, there is a little bit of common sense gone mad. There is a little bit of that there. But on the same token, I also understand when I worked at News Corp, it was such a big organisation that a lot of the times... You thought to yourself, I'm just going to make sure make sure I've got the echo setting correct here. Just bear with me. Uh, yes, I have. It is correct there. Yep. Okay. So, I, you know, a big organisation, like a big country, like a big state, does need to have a set of guidelines that seems to suffice for most scenarios, but then it can look really silly for others. But I don't know, Phil. All I know is at the moment... I can feel, I can just feel it from the conversations I'm having with people, that tensions are going up, and to think that there's a possibility we're around the halfway mark. Some people are suggesting that a third way mark, you know? Um, yeah. yeah. But it's a very, very difficult um, situation for, for most people. Now, you know, to the government, um, you know, some of the negative feedback they've been getting is that they've made their they're messaging too simple and they're not really considering that. Most people that live in Australia, in, in New South Wales, are pretty sophisticated. Just tell them as it is and what's going on. So they tried to dumb down the messaging and dumb down the rules um, and therefore blanket rules on absolutely everything. So what do you do about it? You know, what you've just spelt out there, the fact that you can travel from, from Canterbury to, to Byron Bay to look at a house, but you can't join your wife in a hospital to give birth is absolute bonkers. You know, and you put that in the context as well. Now, now, not not to uh, dismiss the seriousness of this particular virus, um, but if you look at the numbers, there was I don't know two hundred and sixty odd um, 
uh, active, oh, sorry, cases today, uh, a lot of them active in the community. Uh, we, we, the numbers seem to be plateauing around that sort of number. They're not spiking, they're up and down, but we haven't got on top of this yet. But that's on the basis of tens and tens and tens and tens of thousands of uh, tests being done. And when you look at the actual numbers, Tom, it's 0, 0.0 something, 0.01% uh, of, of positive case numbers out of all that sort of stuff. You know, you put that in a context, we are holding back the nation, disrupting the economy, disrupting people's livelihoods, disrupting, more importantly, and, and probably the, the, the biggest emphasis on, on, on people's health and happiness. You know, the question is, how long do you do this until you get an effect? And what is the definition of uh, insanity? It's trying to do the same thing over, over and over and, and, and getting the same um, and, and expecting a, a different outcome. Well, but, but, but Phil, that's what you're in right now. But Phil, does it stand to reason if we weren't going through what we're going through in New South Wales at the moment, that infections and deaths may have skyrocketed? Well, I think that's the reality that's that's waiting around the corner for Australia because you look at the numbers, and, and I'm not a, a vaccine specialist at all or, or anything like that. However, um, the, the goal is to get 70%, 80% of Australia vaccinated. That doesn't mean that we eradicate the virus. You know, our state governments at the moment have got this approach that we want zero cases. Now, for Australia to get out of this, it needs to accept that there is going to be cases in the community. Vaccination doesn't mean zero COVID cases. It means that the impact and implication of the virus is minimised. And, and that's what all the health officials are saying in other parts of the world. You've got places like the UK where they had, um, you know, Freedom Day. They're getting tens of thousands of new cases every single day. They're actually understanding that through vaccinations, you minimise the impact, less people out of hospital, less people in ICU, and therefore less people um, uh, passing away from this horrible uh, illness. So if Australia thinks by vaccinating itself, it's going to eradicate COVID, it's horribly mistaken. We've got to accept that there will be cases in the community moving forward, even if we are vaccinated and work out. And if you go back to what the uh, the Premier said um, last year is that uh, Sydney should be able to move ahead without locking the economy up. She's done it completely the opposite this time around. And this is the big question mark, and this is the impact on Australians, on, on New South Welsh people at the moment, is that they're locked up when they told they were going to be locked up and we were sophisticated enough to navigate through this. So even if we all get vaccinated, they can't keep us locked up. All right, now, Phil, let's move on to another topic here, right? And that is here that, you know, you said to me off air, um, what's the point of going to a bank and getting a loan when, man, there's no stock out there? And that stock level in various parts of Australia, I believe, will actually even get less because there's, a you know, the houses that and units that were going on the market, Phil, were people that had actually done appraisals long before the lockdown. There were lists of people, right? It's, it's People don't wake up and say, I'm putting my home on the market. You know, people have thought it through, right? They've sat down and they've normally, you know, gone through a process of even, you know, went out there house hunting on where they're going to move to, right? So now we've got a situation where stock levels are going to dry up because there are less and less listing presence presentations happening. The agents are telling me that people aren't calling in, whether they're afraid to get COVID, whether they think it's not the right time. Um, the only ones that seem to be doing okay are the vacant houses. But of course, in other parts of Australia, it's going gangbusters, right? Perth, no problems, uh, 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 South Australia. But yeah, Phil, you know, why bother getting a pre-approval, right? Um, Mate, I, I'm super. I'm super torn on this one, Tom, because um, I, I look at the, the the turnaround times to actually get a a, a mortgage set today, uh, or even get a, a pre approved for mortgage, is blown out considerably. So I start thinking about that and go, "All right, well, there's so much inefficiencies in the system at the moment, and and, and you know we, we've got a um, amongst a number of different things. We, we, we're uh, in a mortgage business as well. The amount of time, energy, and effort and work our brokers put into uh, are organising pre-approvals for customers, um, which never realise uh, into a sale, mainly because they can't actually buy a place, not that they don't want to buy a place, is huge. I'd, I'd hate to know what the, the actual percentage number of loans that don't proceed from pre-approval uh, into actually a settled uh, house. 
so much inefficiencies uh, in that system. Now, and I think of that as a property investor. I'm a property investor. Um, I, I run a very big property podcast. And the mantra has always been, before you even start looking at property, make sure you get your finances sorted out, go and get a pre-approval. So you go and do all that work. Everyone does all the heavy lifting to, to get that pre-approval set. Might last for six months or so. And then it just dies and you've got to start the whole process again. So everywhere there is so much inefficiency. So where I'm torn, Tom, is that this mantra of get a pre-approval before you can buy a home or a house or an investment property, does that still stand today? Should you actually get a base understanding, can you or can you not afford a mortgage, yes or no, go and identify the asset, make the sale, and then sort out the loan, knowing that you've already got it secured. I don't know. I don't know. The appropriate and prudent thing to do would be to get a pre-approval, but it's slowing everything up. So what's your thoughts, mate? I think what you do is you, you, you sit down with a broker, the bank, whatever your lender is, most people use brokers these days, and you suss out, hey, here's what we make, here's what we spend, here's what we're thinking of buying at this price point. Can you tell me, are we definites or are we borderlines? What's our level? Then I think what you do feel is when you do find a property, you move quickly and you ask for um, what I consider to be both a long settlement and hopefully a little bit longer as a cooling off period to allow you to sort of then press the green light on that, you know, and it's becoming stock standard now. Having longer settlements to make sure your bank settles in time is becoming standard. Uh, real estate, real estate vendors, real estate vendors uh, also know. I've got, look, I've got auctions at the moment. I've got auctions. It's funny we're talking about this topic because I've got auctions that were scheduled for this Saturday, but the buy, it's a Randwick property, Kensington, sorry, but buyers on that property haven't got their approval as yet. So we're actually pushing the forward auction to the 28th of August, which is going to give people another few weeks to get their finance approved. So it's funny you brought that up because she, the agent rang me up and she said, here's the situation. They're not going to get an approval. And as you know, with auctions, once the hammer goes down, there is no cooling off period. So it's a tough one with people. But I think, Phil, what I said to you about, I mean, you're going to get a 95%, you know, reasonable idea if you actually sit with a broker and the broker's going to say to you, listen, you're out of the ballpark here, right? You know, you can't afford this or, or that. But it's a good point. And I think this is fueled by the fact that there's not a lot of stock fill, you know? No, there's not. There's people who all have the intent to buy and they just can't get them get their hands on um, uh, on a property. And we've spoken about how you think it's going to be one of the biggest spring selling seasons in history with a whole bunch of stock coming on market. So maybe this will get better. But, you know, mortgage brokers, you do a lot of work with mortgage brokers as well as real estate agents, Tom. They want to make sure the work they're doing, they're going to get a paycheck for it, mate. 100%. 100%. And I've seen it with my own broker. I mean, I feel guilty. A lot of the times I ring him up because you've got to be in it to win it. So I'm always, you know, looking at a lot of stuff at the one time and I get him to do work on it and he's only going to get paid when uh, there's a settlement. Um, but, yeah, it's, and the other the other thing is it's really interesting because, Phil, this houses versus unit scenario you mentioned. Yesterday I was talking to Bill in uh, the St. George area and he said to me for the first time in ages, he's now seen signs that units are getting interest again. And the reason this has been, you know, it's only in the last one or two weeks, and I think the reason why, Phil, is this, that the gap between houses and units is getting pretty, pretty um, um, big, and all of a sudden the affordability of a unit becomes an attractive. So it happens in cycles. When the gap gets too big, all of a sudden, hey, unit might sort of suit us. Yeah, I'm seeing the same. And I think there's some units that provide and, and really represent good value at the moment. And, you know, they haven't been the darling of property investors, at least over, you know, this whole COVID period. Uh, we all know that uh, a lot of um, uh, new migrants, students, all this sort of stuff, people coming from outside of Australia to either call Australia home permanently or even temporarily, um, you know, they, cool. they start with the unit. Cool. Keep talking because I've just got to turn a latch on on a door. Someone's trying to come in. 
Typical all right, home. no worries. Well, Tom's about to get robbed. You're all, you're all alone with me. But my particular view on this, uh, Tom, as he walks off, uh, is that they're starting to, to, to look like good value. Uh, there is such a gap between uh, houses and units. So when Tom comes back on, I want to ask him how you go about capitalising as real estate agents on presenting unit markets. I think as soon as migration starts again, I think that as soon as you start getting international students coming back into Australia, buoying up the coffers of our, our universities, they're going to be quite hot. So that's the market. That's what we're seeing right now. Obviously, in the comments below, um, you know, for real estate agents out there, what are you seeing in your particular market? Is there any interest coming back into the unit sector? What is it going to look like into the future? I think there's a golden window for those looking for value inside units. Um, prior to Australia opening up its borders, aviation beginning again, where you can get some good bargains. And there was always this discussion around people don't want to live in units anymore. And you hear about these unit blocks getting locked up because of COVID-19. In the inner city areas, in the areas surrounding the major capital cities, good value for me. Tom, how do agents dissect this when someone comes in saying, I'm looking for a house, what do you got? I don't want a unit. Well, I think the issue is right now is, um, Often you've got to make a decision as a buyer, what do I want? Do I want to buy a house that's going to be in bad condition, but it's going to have land and it's going to mean that I'm going to have to do maintenance on it and I might have to go in and actually spend a bit of money fixing it up even before I rent it out if it's an investment or if it's a unit, I accept that I'm going to get a much better product in terms of presentation and condition and I'm going to be able to rent it out a lot quicker but it's going to mean that there's going to be a cost to that. And that cost is that I'm going to end up having lower capital gains. That's a fact. That's a given fact. We can sit there and we can argue it. But if you look at all the data, the data will tell you over a long period of time, Phil, that houses will outstrip units. And the reason why is you can keep building and reproduce more units than what you can do houses because you need less land with units. You can go up, right? So we clearly know that units will never shoot at the pace of houses. However, having said that, there's also the equation of, hey, I can buy a house in Mount Druitt and have my own block of land, or I buy myself a unit in Newtown and be close to the city. And I'm beginning to think to myself, Phil, that fundamentally houses are going to win out because there are a few things that are happening at the moment in my mind, and that is whether it's a cafe, you're going to see cafes that have got good ventilation, good outdoor areas, they'll do better. We're going to have it to learn with, we're going to have to learn to live in a world where COVID is going to linger on after we move on. And what does that basically mean? We're always going to be concerned about hey, if there is a lockdown, if there is a pandemic, if there is a virus, What's it better to be living in? It's probably better to be living in a house, right? It's probably better to be living in a house than living in a unit that is in a complex of, say, 300 units. You know, we saw that happen in New York and, and the fear it created. Um, but, so the um, question, Tom, the, the question, Tom, I got for you then for agents is um, normally everyone talks about sort of chasing listings. They're always knocking on the doors of houses, you know, like there's a whole bunch of ways you can get... Uh, listings and you do a, a letterbox drop, you knock on someone's door and say, G'day, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, do you want to sell your house? There's this house next door went for this much. Does the same apply for units? Do you see agents actively um, looking to source or win listings for units? It must be a different dynamic. There is. Look, there are real estate agents, for instance. Um, you know, there's a client of mine in Harcourts on, um, on, uh, on the Gold Coast, and he's known as a specialist having units by the water, right? So you do end up getting specialists that work in certain sectors of the marketplace, right? So a lot, most of the times, Phil, in real estate, you've got specialists that are geography specialists, but occasionally you meet a specialist who's actually a property type specialist. They say, I do boarding houses, or I do, you know, beachfront apartments, right? Um, so, um, yes, but look, you know, for me, the bottom line, Phil, is, and anyway, we get a lot of people, we're going to move on and, and talk about this subject because investing in real estate, to me, investing in real estate is the main thing. I think if you can't afford a house, right, man, and you can't afford a house, 
um, anywhere, maybe you look for a unit, even in an outer area, just get into the market because at the moment, Phil, look, every month you're not in the market, it's costing you money. And um, this issue that you spoke about earlier on, Phil, you, you, you asked me, what was the words you asked me off camera about real estate agents uh, and their financial wealth? I can't remember the exact sentence. Yeah, I can't remember. It's pretty much, well, my, I, I, the way I look at it is that you've got agents have the best insight into investing in property than any other largely uh, industry sector. It's such an advantage and it's instilled in them from when they first start in real estate. So they know the how, they know the who, they know the where, they know the why, but why aren't more real estate agents becoming wealthy through investing in property? They seem to blow their dough elsewhere, mate. Why is that? Guys and girls, those on LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, in the comments, because we can't see your comments, tell us, why do you think that a lot of real estate agents themselves don't invest in real estate? Um, I know we're making a general statement, but Phil, here's my 20 cents worth. A lot of real estate agents do actually dress up to look successful. And when I say dress up to look successful, I'm talking about a $3,000 a month car lease. I'm talking about rotating seven or eight suits worth two grand each. I'm talking about um, um, having holidays when there's no lockdowns, flying business class, and uh, actually staying at decent places, W Hotel. As Adam Freitas says, one of the winners, he actually won the biggest award in REB two years ago. He won the big award, REB. You know, when you have, he's a, he's, he's a business development manager, but you have uh, you have that one big award, Adam Freitas. Yeah, the excellent award, REB Excellence Award. Correct. Well done, Adam. Sucked in, but Adam, Canberra Raiders aren't going well. There's a mad Canberra Raiders supporter. Fast cars and flashy suits is put down as one of the reasons it's happening. Fast cars and flashy suits. Um I think I think that's I think that's part of it. I think a lot of re, I, th I think a lot of these million dollar agents actually start thinking I've got to dress and look like a million dollar agent. Um, and uh, Maria Maria here, let's bring her on there. She's a client I had a coaching session with the other week. I love real estate. I'm an investor as well as an agent. Beautiful. Then we've got Warren. He says they're spending yeah. it on fifteen thousand dollar watches. 15, what, what, can I just see the watch you're wearing, mate? Can you show no, us your watch? I don't wear a watch, mate. No, okay, there you go. That's why I he's my, home. I got my, 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 I got, I got my time on my, uh, on my clock there. Okay, Denise, Denise Hardman says the debit credit cycle, they end up that, you know, it's a little bit like uh, that mice on a ladder. They keep climbing, climbing, they keep spending money and they get to. So, 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 so the, the question then, uh, Tom, and, and we are generalizing a little bit here and I'll, I'll, I'll call that out um but this is a perception and and with all the advantages real estate agents have and also property managers um to align their thinking to think about wealth creation now is this just an inherent cycle of young agents come in they, they see the glitz and glamour the the, the flashiness they they look at the, the 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 top performing salesperson in their offers what they're doing they look to emulate it so where should the mentorship start and stop to help the next generation of agents come through and think about tomorrow, think about creating wealth along the way rather than blowing all their down on 15K watches. Well, sadly, Phil, I reckon a lot of it's got to be, got to be dictated by the office that they're working for, right? Because when you're a young girl or guy in real estate, who are the people that are influencing you? Man, look, I'd love to think, I'd love to think that I'm one of those people and I do that on a wider scale, sharing my views, thinking that, hey, this is what I think is good for you. But generally speaking, the person that's going to have the most influence is going to be your principal, right? Your principal. So if you've got a principal that basically says, now listen, let's put a business plan down together. Let's try and help you actually achieve an income of 300 grand. And if you do that, you're going to be left with $40,000 at the end of the year that we can buy an investment property, right? You can't buy one through our own office, but we're going to buy one in our local area because we know the area. And you're going to look around on realestate.com and you're going to buy one there, right? If you've got a principle that guides you towards that direction, you'll probably go that path. If you've got a principle that shows you, hey, this is the life. We sit out at... Um, 
Woolamaloo at China, China Doll every Friday, one o'clock to four o'clock. We have drinks. That's the life that you have with us. You'll probably go down that path. So a lot of it's got to do is what's the world that you're exposed to? What's the environment that you work with, right? So I think it's funny. It's, it's, we should talk about that, you know, and I'm looking at some of the comments coming in. Most agents do not understand cash flow and wealth creation, and many principals want their agents in hock to their eyeballs so they have no choice but to run very fast. Thanks a lot, you know. Could be true. I actually, having said that, I don't think debt's a bad thing um, as a as a motivator for you, you know. Oh, it can be, but it's got to be good debt, mate. If it's if it's paying off uh, uh, property, investment properties, fair enough. But if you're going to the hock on a credit card to buy a watch uh, and, you're not, and you're only making minimum repayments each uh, month on your credit card statement, I'd say that's pretty bad debt. Where are you now, now, Phil? Before we finish off, I want to ask you: Where are you at with things at the moment? Are you sitting there thinking to yourself, "I better jump in and pick up another investment," or it's priced too high? There's too much heat. Let's wait till there's more stock on the market, and hopefully, I can buy at you know at a time when there's more around, and I don't have to pay a frenzy price. Where are you at? Yeah, it's a good. Good point. Um, I'd say I'm on a couple of different levels. So um, I use a buyer's agent a lot for, for securing property purely because I don't have the time, energy and bandwidth and I leverage their capabilities. So I've got a mandate with my buyer's agent that says, this is what I'm looking for. You find it, I'll buy it. Um, so this is what buyer's agents do really well. Off-market stuff that never even hits it. They just find this stuff, whether it's um, you know distressed assets, uh, whether it's d divorce or debt or, you know, all these other things uh, out there, if they can find me an absolute cracker and I've got a mandate of the sort of stuff I'm looking for, I'm saying find it and I'll buy it. On the flip side of that, I'm just, um, I'm beefing up at the moment, Tom. Um, you know, I've got all my money sitting in offsets against mortgages, so I'm paying very little um, uh, interest on the debt that I have. Uh, bank, I'm looking banks, at hate you. banks would hate you. They're not making any money out of you. Well, this is it, you know, you can have debt there, but if you've got to offset, it means that you're not paying any money on the debt and you can just pull it out when you're ready to go. So it gives you strength and it gives you an ability to be fluid in your decision making where you don't need to worry about trying to go and, uh, um, you know, get a pre-approval, which you spoke about before. But, you know, I'm looking for some interesting assets at the moment. Um, there's a couple of areas of Sydney, which I really like. I quite like the Central Coast at the moment. I'm looking for something up there. And I've even spoken to uh, I think one of um, one of the great agents up there who um, is, uh, you know, and well through the real estate uh, gym. Um, mate, I'm waiting for all this stock to come on market. You keep telling me about to try and take some of the competition out of the market. So come spring selling season, mate, I'll be ready to strike. Some big some big results out there. The property sold in Avoca for $8.8 .8 million um, last week. Um who knows? Who knows, Phil? Maybe this lockdown on the Central Coast is going to create a bit of, you know, repressed vendors that are hit the market all at the one time and you'll be able to jump in. But I've got to tell you, from the commercial investment point of view, I've been tracking the market. Man, I've got to tell you, it is gone crazy. A childcare centre in Sylvania sold for 3.75% yesterday. 3.75% net yield. These things were selling before at 6 and 7%. It appears that, you know, people have basically said, man, there's no interest, uh, you know, there's no point having getting interest in the bank, right? And they're prepared to take 3% yields. Um, so... Hey, mate, commercial is a tough market at the moment. And if you're looking at that, um, there are so many cash buyers out there and, and we're not talking they've got a couple of million bucks lying around. They've got big wallets and they're buying up big. So if you want to com compete and participate in a commercial market right now, whew, I'd say it's even more competitive than, than Resi to get good assets. And, you know, I, I do a, a podcast, you know, Scott O'Neill from Rethink yes, Investing. Yes, I do. Tom, I've got him. You know, he's him. going, you know, yeah. we, we sit there going because we've been doing a podcast around commercial properties going, I think we've made a, we made a monster here. There is there's so many people in um, looking at uh, commercial for good reason. The, you know, a lot of people looking to calibrate their their residential property portfolio to make it more of a, a income producing thing, balance out some of the the negative cash flow. There, uh, commercial is a great enabler for that. But you know, you speak to Scott, and he'll tell you at any given time in Australia, there's you know a handful of really good properties for sale. The rest of them are. 
You know, you, you wouldn't touch him. All righty. Phil, I love having this chat once a week. See you next week. Stay healthy. Say hi to all the team there at REB. By the way, if you want to get your information on real estate at a quick snapshot, it costs you no money. Make sure you're on the REB uh, email list that comes out every morning and you can get a short read on what's going on because we know that you want to sound like you know what you're talking about when you're talking to people in real estate and being um, being a, a person that is a bit of a handyman, a bit of a view on every topic is going to help you have a lot of conversations with your different kinds of people. Bill? Well, Tom, mate, that's a, I just I, I wanted to talk about this at the front end when we did the introduction to this um, uh, the podcast. We'll close with this, sorry, this, this stream. Um, We'll close with this, and I want your views on it. So when when we went into this particular uh, live stream, we just went bang straight into it. How much small talk do you need to be an effective real estate agent? And you're talking about there being a generalist, a bit of an every man or every woman, being able to talk and converse about most things. How much does it matter? How much do you do before you get into the business of real estate? Well, I can tell you one thing for sure. If you're giving people bad news in real estate, if you're giving people bad news in real estate, I learned this, and I'm gonna. I love finishing on a on a on a topic that's gonna resonate with people and give them very practical tips. I'm gonna share this story with you, Phil. The FBI negotiator, the FBI negotiator that spoke at Eric a few years ago by the name of Chris Voss. What his job would be is when a child got uh, hijacked, you know, um, and they uh, say, "Listen, we want twenty million dollars to get your kid back," so they would steal kids from rich families. Chris Voss would get involved and his job would be to actually go off and negotiate um, to get the hostage back, often young kids. And he'd have to give feedback to the families while he's doing it. And most of the time, the feedback he would give them is he'd have no positive news as yet, right? So he said, one of the things is it's not the time to do small talk. So everyone listening here, when you've got bad news, for instance, if you've got news to tell your vendor that their sale has just fallen through, you don't ring up and have small talk and talk about, you know, bits and issues that don't matter. You basically go in and this was his approach. Hi, it's Chris Voss here, letting you know I've got no news. Letting you know here are the five things that we're going to do to help us move forward over the next 24 hours. So he'd go straight to the problem, he'd give them the bad news and then give them a solution. However, Phil, when you're in real estate and you're pitching for the business, right, and we're not talking about bad news, we're talking about going in there to actually get someone to like you, trust you, pick you over the other agents, you've got to be able to go in and move with the flow. You've got to be prepared that no training course survives collision with reality. So if you're sitting there and you see a set of golf clubs, right, and you can tell the guy's got six golf trophies up on the wall and you can see that this guy's got, you know, another painting of him at a golf course in the USA, you know that this is a hot button for him. So it's useful to be able to say, hey, have you ever played at uh, Concord, right? Right. Or if you could see that, you know, this person is a, an executive for, you know, Afterpay, that you can actually sort of say, hey, I realise that there's a big deal going on with Afterpay. It was in the Fin Review today, right? And you can throw in your 20 cents worth. That's where I think what it does, Phil, it helps you keep a conversation going by putting in the little gaps. I don't think people want a one-dimensional agent. I think they want a human being that they think, hey, you know what? That was a nice, fluid conversation. And, um, yeah, does that sort of make sense, Phil? Yeah, it does. It's got to be a storyteller, Tom. Oh, absolutely. Story sell, facts tell. Be a good storyteller. I've got to yeah. tell you. Yeah, I've got to tell you. Too many people think it's about facts, data, and information. It is important. Don't get me wrong. But fundamentally, stories drive people's decisions, whether they're stories that give people hope or whether they're stories that give people belief that they're going to reduce suffering. That's what you've got to do. You've got to be a good storyteller for them. You're a good yeah. storyteller. Good good counsel. Yeah, and, and I think to to be a good storyteller, you need to have a pretty broad um, 
uh, suite of stuff you can talk about, you know, and, and that comes down to reading, comes down to listening, it comes down to, you know, being aware of what's going on right now. Um, and that's what people want to do, storytelling. Yeah, maybe, let me finish and let you know. I know what's going on tonight. Everyone, tune in. We've got Australia is playing the USA in basketball, right? Big game for the Olympic Games. Big, 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 Australia. Then you've got the Kookaburras that are playing for gold against Belgium in the hockey, right? So we've got two big things for Aussies. And I reckon at the moment, Phil, the Olympic Games have come in at the right time during this COVID. Give oh, yeah. people you, you couldn't have, you couldn't have timed it. You couldn't have timed it better. What I'd like to know, uh, Tom, um, and for some reason, I don't know how I got scrolling on it. You had him on uh, on your uh, your Sunday night rant recently, or on the real estate gym. Is it Vlad? Vlad the uh, yes, my cousin Vlad. My cousin Vlad. <laughs> he, he's quite funny. He is funny. He is, is funny. He yeah. is funny. He, he, he rang me up and he said, let's 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 make the people smile. Let's make the people smile. I said, all righty, come on. It's funny you talk about that because Mark Burris hit me up just before I came on. He's coming on on Sunday night, Ram. Oh, Mate, he'll have a good old crack. Don't worry about that. He's uh, He's got some views towards uh, how small business is struggling at the moment and what needs to be done. So, yeah, you, you guys will get right stuck into that. Guys and girls, thank you so much. We want to build this show up to get big numbers. Thank you so much. And Denise, thanks for your contribution today. Adam Freitas telling us more about worrying about my tiger side. And then, of course, Vanessa saying it's all about life experience. Phil, see you next week.